Hey, hey, hey. So that was Manu from Money on Chain. And so it's kind of like stable coins and, and inflation, and everything is kind of like the past. And Smuggy's always looking into into the future here. It's always great to talk to you. How you doing, man? Doing very well. How are you? Yeah. So I'm enjoy I'm enjoying life. <laughs> Uh, it's nice being in the middle of, of things that are happening and, and, and moving things forward. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Um, so, it's, you first introduced your, your digital bear, bear assets to me, I guess, about two or two years ago. Uh, we, we met in, in Bratislava, uh, had a great conversation. Uh, you also had a presentation in uh, Parallel Nicolas in Prague. Uh, and I guess things have moved forward in your thinking and uh, and your research. And yeah. today you're going to share with us where you're going and where you see where you see the future. I shall. <laughs> cool. Take it away, smuggler. Okay. Uh, so today I want to speak about something that. Um, is new to most people that is uh, called fast, untraceable, cheap, federated charming mints. And that requires some explanation. So let me start with that. So there are essentially three big um, technologies that implement digital value transfers or payments, if you want to say so. So the, the thing that most people are um, accustomed to are account-based systems. So you have a um, distributed but usually centralized database um, where you have records for how much money uh, somebody owns or to be more specific, how much um, money is owed to somebody. And that is how your standard bank uh, usually cr um, records um, the money you have on your account and implements transactions. And there's a variation to that, which is quite interesting, uh, which is the uh, open transactions uh, co-signed account state, which prevents the bank to make modifications to your account without your consent and makes your bank account and transaction history provable uh, with cryptography. And then we have what is all the rage these days um, that are distributed ledgers um, based on some kind of blockchain technology. So you have um, a more or less endless transaction graph or account state graph that in some way is distributed and decentralized uh, usually. And you uh, gain consensus with a consensus algorithm that is usually proof of work or proof of state or something similar. And those are the two things that uh, probably everybody of you knows. But then there's uh, a third thing, and that is uh, Chomian Digital Cash or Digital Bureau Certificates. And this technology is actually quite old. It has been invented by Chom and others in 83 of the last millennium. Um, has been refined in '88, and there was actually a company based uh, on it, which is which was called DigiCash, and that operated till '99. So, what is digital Chromium Cash or Chromium Digital Cash? It is a certificate that is issued by an issuer, a mint or a bank. It's a digital certificate, which means that it consists of two parts. It is um, a statement like this is this much money or I owe this person this much money and a signature of the issuer. So it's very simple. So you have a digital uh, signature over a statement and the signature itself authenticates the statement. So if I say I'm bank A, I owe bank B this much money, then I sign the statement and that becomes a certificate. Now the problem with that is that digital values can be copied as much as you want. So you have to solve the double spend issue. And that is very easy to solve because the only thing you have to do is to record all certificates whose statements have been executed already. So you're having a, a record, a database that says, these are all the statements that are not valid anymore. It's the so-called spend book. And then, 
if you apply some interest in cryptography, you can make those certificates untraceable. So untraceable means that the bank cannot say whom they issued um, a, a certificate to or uh, which certificate was used by what person. And that is reached by so-called blind digital signatures. Blind uh, digital signatures are different from normal uh, digital signatures. So in a normal digital signature, you have uh, a signer that uh, creates a key pair, a public key and a private key, and publishes the public key. And then there's a signed transaction in which the signer takes a message, applies his or her private key, and generates a signature. And then everybody who knows the public key, the signature, and the message can verify that those three belong together and that the signer actually created this signature. And since it's an asymmetric operation, and the private key has not been published, it basically states that the signer actually created this signature. In a blind signature, this is a little bit different because in a blind signature, you have a client that creates a special message that blinds the actual contents of the real message. So there's a secret value that a client uses to combine with a message and create a blind message that doesn't uh, divulge inf any information about what is actually in the real message. Then it sends this blinded message to the signer. The signer applies the private key and creates a blind signature. And then the client can use the blinding uh, parameter from step one, unblind the signature, and then everybody can again verify that the signature the message and the public key belong together. Now, the interesting thing is that if you have true blind signatures, there are two aspects that are fulfilled. Number one is that the signer does not actually know what he's signing. And the second thing is that the signer or anybody else except for the client is able to link to um, a, a blind signature to an unblind signature or a blind message to an unblind message. So the link between the message that is verified with an open signature and the signing operation itself, this, these two operations are unlinkable or untraceable. Now, <clears throat> that has an interesting implication if you apply that to the Chaumian cash system of signed certificates. Number one, what you get is a value transfer system that is extremely cheap. So just look at what operations the bank has to do here. It has to verify the signature on a certificate. It has to verify that the certificate has not been used previously. That is the double spend protection step. It has to store the certificate as being spent now and then sign the new certificate. So these are two relatively cheap database operations, one uh, signature verification and one signature creation. That is something that you can parallelize very um, efficiently. And that means that in milliseconds, you can create hundreds of, of signatures or operations like this. And if you're using blind signatures in this, this also means that the connection from certificate to certificate, uh, certificate to user, et cetera, is completely untraceable. And by implication, that makes it anonymous. There's an argument why that is the case, but I'm not going to in into that. It's self-explanatory. So the interesting thing with blind signatures is, is that the anonymity set is as big as all signatures made during the lifetime of the signing key. So if you have a bank that does a few thousand transactions per hour and um, re-issues uh, its signing key, let's say once a month, you have millions uh, of uh, certificates in which you uh, hide yourself. There's a downside to Chomian um, blind signatures or Chomian cash. And that is the reason why um, we got involved in, in research, and that is, that Chomin Cash has a single issuer. So there's a single bank that signs those certificates. 
And that means that the certificate uh, that issuer can invent certificates out of thin, thin air and can inflate the currency. It also means that if the issuer disappears, the certificates become worthless. And that can happen for any number of reasons. This the bank goes bankrupt or the government comes and shuts it down or asteroids strike or whatever. So Chomin Cash suffers from issuer risk and governance risk. And the solution to that is to decentralize Chomin Cash. So that means that instead of relying on a single issuer that uh, makes all the decisions, you are splitting the operation over a group of issuers that must coordinate and cooperate their operations. And that is where Scrit comes um, <clears throat> into the picture. So Scrit is a protocol and a software that instead of using a single issuer, is using a federation of issuers. Those issuers must accept each other, but apart from that, they, they don't have to uh, cooperate outside the protocol at all. The basis of the script protocol is that um, a quorum of those federation members must agree on each and every transaction. If only uh, lesser than quorum issuers make a transaction, that transaction is never valid. And federation members accept previous quorum decisions of the federation. So that allows you to replace members of the federation at any time. <clears throat> so the modification from, from Chomin Blind Cash is that instead of having one signature per statement in a certificate, we have the statement now and every um, mint or issuer that participated in the transaction adds its own signature to it. The signatures are blind. That means that there's no uh, way that any issuer, any mint can link input and output certificates uh, to each other. So all transactions are truly untraceable. And in the background, the um, mints or issuers are uh, cooperating based on a distributing voting protocol. This is specific for Scrit. There are other implementations that are worked on that use uh, different ways. But um, Scrit itself has this voting protocol where basically every member of the federation makes a public commitment um, over this is the input uh, certificate with which I am paid. This is the output certificate that is requested as the output of the transaction. And that commitment is broadcasted. And then um, when enough uh, members of the Federation have broadcasted um, commitments that uh, match each other, and there has been no broadcast that has disagreed, then the transaction can go forward at every Federation. So it's this distributing voting that is the only communication that happens between the Federation members. So what is the current status of Scrit? Um, the Federated Chomin Banks, there are basically two people working on it. Uh, there's Zeb working on it. He has uh, an implementation that he works on. And there's me working on it, um, which is Scrit. So these are two different systems. They share part of the transaction design or the, the overall um, architecture but they differ in uh, details. Um, and I'm going to talk about Scrit only because that is my baby and I actually don't have big insight into what Zeppel has been doing. So what is Scrit right now? Um, Scrit is an SDK, a software development kit that implements the Scrit protocol. And it is a collection of programs that are um, the mints, the issuers itself, spend books, um, network communication, etc. And you can use the SDK to create clients that use the federation. Um, the governance of the federation is implemented by CodeChain, which is um, something that Frank Braun wrote a couple of years ago. It is basically a hash chain based voting system for issuing um, verified code but it can also be used to 
um, verify configuration files, for example. And in the case of Script, it is used by the Federation members to agree on the configuration of the Federation. So who's part of the Federation, et cetera. Script also currently um, supports um, to, the, to the power of 32 currencies or assets. So that means that instead of being able to only work with one currency, you can um, create a lot of currencies in the system. Uh, users can create their own currencies. And those currencies can be backed in various ways. So either they're completely unbacked, meaning that a user just tokenizes some statement of it, um, or they can be backed by um, legal structure behind the federation. So that can be used, for example, to um, scritify things like US dollars or companies or shares or stuff like that. And you have the possibility to also scritify uh, digital currencies as long as those um, digital currencies have multi-signature support. So if you have a federation of, let's say, 15 um, issuers, then if you want to scritify uh, Bitcoin, for example, you're creating a quorum of 15 um, multi-sig um, account uh, address for the Bitcoin so that the same um, distribution rules apply both to the um, backing behind the currency and the certificates itself. And that would allow you, for example, to make completely untraceable Bitcoin payments. The implementation in Script, as said, is um, voting based. And there are two uh, implementations to that. There's a leader based voting initiation, which <clears throat> basically allows you to have. Uh, hundreds or thousands of, of issuers, but it is relatively slow. So it takes a couple of seconds for a transaction. And in the context of, Mint, uh, of script, that is very slow. And there's an unoptimized voting that only works to about 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more, but it's very uh, traffic intensive. And that is um, very much faster. And we'll come to that later. <clears throat> So what else is implemented? Um, certificates in the system uh, can be owned. And if a certificate is assigned to an owner, the certificate itself contains information about who owns it. And that means that the owner of the transaction has to sign, uh, the owner of a certificate has to sign a transaction. And there uh, is a, a whole set of um, ownership um, operator, operators in the system. So you can select owners uh, just by public key, or you can say um, it, a certain certificate belongs to a certain person uh, during a certain time range, and uh, afterwards it belongs to somebody else. You can have uh, an, um, uh, multi signatures. You can uh, make decisions based on external oracles. Um, you can make uh, decisions based on uh, what kind of certificates are present in a transaction, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole language that allows you to model possible transactions, which is very useful when you're talking, for example, about um, using script to um, cryptify um, shares of companies. So you can have um, differences, for example, between the ability to sell those shares or the ability to prove that you're owner of the share and then vote for the share, for example. Um, or you can have shares that don't have voting rights or you can split out voting rights from a share, etc. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, Script implements transaction proofs, which allow you as the owner of uh, a certificate or somebody who knows the certificate to show if this uh, certificate has been used in a transaction already, like if it's valid, if it was under what condition it was used, or maybe even if it hasn't been used. And for every certificate, the mints have to prove that the transaction has actually been um, executed by the permission of the owner. 
and you can reproduce that uh, proof to third parties at any time. And then um, in script, all transactions are indemnitant, which means that even if you lose network connection, um, if you lose your database, etc., as long as you keep your keys, it's not a big deal. You can recover at any point, and even if some of the mints disappear, the whole system can be recovered and replayed. So it has uh, some built-in stability. And then lastly, there's the big subject of swaps. So as I said before, there are billions and billions of currencies that you can implement within one SCRID um, federation. And that makes SCRID very interesting for swap transactions. So a swap transaction is you have two different currencies as an input to a transaction, <clears throat> and then you swap owners between those assets. Um, so in SCRID, you can build complex swaps. So complex swaps can contain hundreds of different of owners, hundreds of different uh, currencies. Um, there's no limit on which currencies you can use or how many uh, owners there can be or how they're transacted. So the owners just come together, create the, the swap transaction together. If uh, they're all happy with it, they sign it, send it to the federation, and then get their, their new certificates back. There, those swaps are executed completely or not at all. So there's no partial execution of swaps, but you can have alternative swap transactions that you prepare, and then uh, one party selects which uh, of those transactions to actually execute. Then you can, of course, use um, external oracles, for example, to say, I want to execute this kind of uh, transaction now, or I want to uh, execute another kind of transaction. So it's very easy to do things like currency exchange, for example. <clears throat> the parties that are involved um, blind their outputs independently, which means that even if you're um, cooperating in a swap with some person that you don't trust, um, that person will not be able to see any information about the output certificates. It will only know, okay, there have been valid output certificates, but it's impossible to trace those output certificates by any other party in the transaction. And for your own um, output certificates in a transaction, you can always recover the signatures for them, which means that even if um, the parties do not complete the protocol completely, you're never lo uh, losing your money. So <clears throat> as I said, it's um, implemented as an SDK and uh, a couple of, of binaries for that. Uh, so just to give you an, an overview on um, what the power speed, et cetera, of the system is, uh, I set up um, a 15 mint federation uh, with a quorum of 10. So 10 of those 15 mints have to agree. There's um, a 250 millisecond latency between the clients and the mint. Um, that is uh, full latency, so back and forth. There's a 100 millisecond latency between the mints. And there's a 50 percent, uh, 50 millisecond jitter, so uh, differences in, in latency. And there's some packet loss. Uh, so it's a realistic environment for the internet. It's actually relatively um, pessimistic. It uses UDP as a transport, and it goes through uh, three steps. So uh, it sets up the the federation, which means that it creates keys for uh, the currencies that are involved in the transaction or the currency that is involved in the transaction. So there's an, actually an asset creation step there. Then it is issuing uh, three certificates and distributing it to the mint to the client, and then the client is actually making a transaction. So it's a, basically a full um, bootstrap plus transaction that is happening here. And the transaction has three inputs and one output, which is important because uh, cryptographically, the inputs are the, um, the expensive part. It, it takes more time to verify um, a signature and verify the database than to create a new signature. And the results are basically that you can make a transaction way below uh, 700 milliseconds in a realistic scenario. So let's look at it. So 
So what I've seen here is three transactions, including uh, setup of the federation. Um, as you can see, uh, all of those transactions have basically happened uh, below 600 milliseconds. You can also see the uh, partial transactions with the mints. Um, this is using the op uh, unoptimized uh, voting protocol. So it actually talks with all mints at the same time. And the per mint transactions are basically happening under 600 milliseconds. And keep in mind, the transaction would actually be uh, settled and confirmed if only quorum um, mints have been talked to. So instead of talking to all 15, as shown in this example, it's actually enough to talk with 10 of them. And that is basically the status of Scrit and what Scrit is. And I'm open to questions. Thank you. OK, so <laughs> I swear to God, this is the third time I've, I've, I've listened to you talk about this, and every time my brain explodes. Um, my, fir my, my first question is, um, where does the data live? Which database are you, are you using for, for all of this? So every mint is using its own database for the uh, mint only state um, it's really important that only the mints do need something like global state everybody else in the system doesn't you you only need to have your own certificate so you don't have to download a global state whatever 500 gigabytes of blockchain or anything but so you only have a few uh, kilobytes of of what your actual money is and the uh, mints themselves have database and the database uh, that is used in my uh, configuration is a, is a simple um, key value database uh, it's called bolt but um, the technicalities is it really doesn't matter it's just a simple key value database that you need Okay, so in, in this case, it's just residing on your local machine, but at scale, if we were to implement this uh, for for digital currencies, where would where would those databases live? Then? Uh, so they live with each uh, mint of the federation. That is where the databases are. So if you have a federation of 15, 20, 50 mints, um, they have the database on their systems. And you yourself only have a database for your own money, uh, which can actually be a text file if you want to, uh, to, to be um, adventurous. <laughs> but um, there is no such thing that everybody has to have the database because the value and validity of a DVC is um, shown by two things. And that is number one, by the signatures that are part of the certificate and by the lack of a transaction proof. So if you have your certificate with all the signatures on it, you can go to any mint and make a transaction with it. And the mint will do this transaction if the signatures are correct, as long as he doesn't have a transaction proof to the negative. And if he has a transaction proof to the negative, he will send you that transaction proof and say, you already use this money and proves it cryptographically. That's it. So there's no need to copy the a blockchain, for example, a uh, hundred thousand times and 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 waste uh, petabytes in, in storage. There's no need for that. Okay. So the average so the average DBC script DBC is how big? Um, that depends directly on the number of uh, mints in the federation. But it is uh, 128 bytes for the statement, and then another uh, 48 bytes for each signature. So it's a couple of hundred bytes. OK, so then the next thing is, let's talk about this at scale. You obviously, from the beginning, thought about, thought about scaling issues. Why don't you go through so that decision tree of problem and solution. OK, so the, the interesting thing with DVC-based systems is that they don't rely on interlo um, interlocking state. So every DVC basically 
only depends on its own state, which means that you can uh, shard a DBC system um, basically linearly. So there's no there's no issue with scaling operators in it. So you only become uh, you only get um, interlocking state if you're using a lot of certificates in the same transaction. So if you're having 100 input DBCs in one transaction, then of course the state of all of those 100 uh, DBCs has to be checked, which however is uh, relatively easy to do with, with transactional programming. So even if you hundred, have hundreds of inputs, um, the actual uh, processing is very limited when it comes to what data has to be accessed, et cetera. Um, when it comes to storage, um, it is the transaction proof that has to be stored by the mints. And it has to be stored until the end of the lifetime of the signature, uh, the signature keys. So the transaction proof itself is a couple of hundred bytes. So it's basically a hash of the input DBC, it's a hash of the output DBCs, and it's the signature itself by the owner. So the key is issue here being not a shared state being required. Yes, there's no shared state that is required. So um, the only sharing happens if you add them to the same transaction. Um, and that means that if you make transactions, the bottlenecks in uh, the system are actually network and processing. So it's not um, a database success or anything, but it's how fast can you calculate the, the signatures? How fast can you uh, verify the signatures? And how fast can you transmit the, the voting over the network? Mm -hmm. And we designed everything so that um, in most cases, most typical transactions fit into a single UDP package. So there's a, a single uh, package, UDP and IP, that is sent to all mints and one that comes back. And so, that's, also, so, so that architecturally, that's essentially you're going to transmit the packet multiple times for yes, the loss. In, and you're not splitting up the data across packets. No, no. So because the, the certificates are relatively small and the transactions are relatively small, most typical transactions can be done in a single UDP package. And um, all the, the voting protocol fits into a single UDP package always. And that means that the communication between the mints is relatively fast. It, has, it doesn't have to keep any state either. So um, we're just collecting um, votes, basically. Mm -hmm. And that means that you have those two issues. You have um, how long does it take to verify and sign? This is issue number one. And then issue number two is how many uh, transactions are going on at the same time. And the latter is a question of how much uh, transactions you can keep in memory. So on a on a, my standard laptop, um, I can do something like 10,000 transactions per um, second, except for the signature val uh, validation. So. Uh, creating signatures uh, 10,000 a second, uh, doing the voting protocol 10,000 a second. Um, signature verification is more expensive, but it is something that can be easily distributed over a cluster. So it is the scaling issue is really an issue of how much processing power do you throw at it? And it scales linearly more or less with you know different uh, angles uh, for all those factors. Uh, it is very realistic to build a system that can do uh, thousands of transactions per second. Cool. So I think that this is like real, really foreign territory for a lot of Bitcoiners and a lot of people, a lot of people in what is called crypto, even though this is like some pretty pure crypto, basically the bare bones of crypto. Let's bring it to a level that I think that that many people are thinking about. So we have a bounty track uh, uh, on Gitcoin for Sovereign uh, for privacy and shielded transactions, right? Um, and then we're also going to be implementing the Arbitrum uh, rollup uh, coming up soon, uh, also for for scalability. Um, and so we have optimistic rollups. We're projected to have uh, you know even more advanced zero knowledge proofs with the calculation time coming down. Why don't you take those two pieces of our current toolbox and explain to people how it is that, um, you know, this 
as a layer two or layer three solution uh, would work uh, on Bitcoin or existing currencies, as opposed to just how it is that you can transfer them all around. Okay. So um, practically, how would Scrit uh, work on top of, of Bitcoin as this? Um, you create a f federation of um, people that operate um, those mints together. Each of them, uh, them is independent, but they agree that they work together. Um, so then, that's the only collusion is an agreement to work together. There's not really the the agreement is um, we I as a mint operator accept you as a mint operator as well. That is the agreement. So I have to to so basically it's opt in at that sense basically it is, for, yes. every, for every federation. It's yes. not a predetermined federation. It's a rolling uh, set of federations that people can opt into or opt out of at any yes. time. Yes, the the only um, issue, so to speak, is that the quorum uh, of all existing mints have to accept you as a new member, so you can take part in the operation. So that's basically it. And what what methodology would people use to to choose to accept a mint or not? Is it based on any, any sort of history, or is it what is the? There's is nothing. It essentially, an agreement of a of a of a temporary rule set or no. so um your mint software is configured and it says these are the the mints that i'm uh, accepting as other mints and this configuration is created from a code chain so code chain is this um hash chain based uh, voting based uh, system that was originally designed to secure the secure issuance and distribution of code like source code, and it can also that be was used. where our conversation actually started yes. in, in Bratislava was verifying binaries, right? Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. So, essentially, what you do is some people start a code chain and say we are creating a new federation, and they configure their mints and put the configuration into the code chain, and then other people have to ask manually, um, "Can I take part?" And if existing mints agree, then they're added to the code chain, they're added to the configuration, and the mints accept them. So the the governance part is um, manual, but supported by cryptography. We're not making any rules of um, how a federation is created, because Scrit is not a single system. It's a technology. It's not like Bitcoin, where you only have one Bitcoin, like one Bitcoin network. but Scrit is a network of networks that can interact with each other, that have different risk profiles, different assets, whatever, and they don't overlap. So it's more like you have hundreds of those. Your local community can have one. Uh, your country can have one. You can make one of only people with blonde hair and another one of people with brown hair or whatever. You know, It's completely up to you how you select uh, um, federations. And um, they're all independent from each other, but they can cooperate. So you can uh, create transactions that go from one uh, script federation to another script federation. Okay. But so the primary use case that I'm thinking of, that I'm that I'm trying to figure out how this how this is an improvement. Um, so we're we're currently on the on the rootstock uh, chain on RSK, um, a level two solution, and they have a a, a multi sig federation of fifteen. Uh, I believe is what the number is. And people are always criticizing the solution that those those 15 uh, multi-sigs can get together and pull the rug on the whole system. And this is the primary sort of like criticism that you see of this of, of layer two solutions. How does Scrit compare with, with that? Now, what is the advantage that it offers us there? Well, the, the uh, criticism would be the same. So if you're creating a, a script federation that uh, governs something like, like Bitcoin on chain, then this federation can, of course, collude. And if enough come together, they can uh, sign the multisig and get the money out. The question is really, um, what are your demands for trust? 
and where do you keep your money? So um, for me, the calculation is a different one. So I would not use Squid for storing my Bitcoin in Squid. That's bullshit. You use it for transactions. So what you would do is you say, okay, I'm whatever, transacting 500 euros in, in Bitcoin every day. Um, so I take 500 euros, put it in the Squid wallet backed by Bitcoin, use it for transactions. And then if I underrun my threshold, I add new Bitcoin. And if I overrun my threshold, I, I move it back to the chain. That is how you do it. So the I think there's a mistake in thinking that we have to build systems that have a zero trust in all levels. We don't need that. What we need is we need very low trust in the base layer and then risk profiling on the layers uh, above that. That's a basic um, decision we, we do every time. You know, If you go shopping, you're making a risk calculation if you go, should go to that shop or to that restaurant. You know, Will they poison me? Will they not poison me? Will they hit me over the head, etc.? It's the standard thing that humans do all the time is risk calculations. And so, to, I, so to take that away from specifically about Squid, um, let's look at it in, in, in the discussion that we have happening about level two solutions from somebody who's been around the space from the beginning. What are the what are the essential arguments that we need to bring into the dialogue to make people understand that trustlessness is not necessary at every level? Yeah, other than that metaphorical one that you just used. Yeah. yeah. So as a thought leader in the space, right? Let's, so let's direct direct people's attention to what it is that they should be considering about level two and level three. So the, the, the real question is. Um, what does trust and risk really mean? And in the context of payment systems, they mean two things. There are two different kinds of, of risk that you have to deal with. It's the risk of losing money, and it's the risk of losing privacy. Those are the two things that you can lose in a payment system. And when it comes to the risk of losing money, it's very easy. Just don't put all your money into one solution, unless that solution is highly trustable, as in Bitcoin, for example. So keep the most money in Bitcoin, where the main um, property of the system is relative trustlessness. And if you're looking for something like uh, very fast transactions or um, privacy or something like that, you step you exchange those features like privacy and speed, you exchange them for having a little bit uh, more risk. That is, you potentially risk at a certain amount of money that you put into the system. And even there, if it's a single issuer system, yes, the risk of total failure is relatively high. But if you're uh, looking at a federation, etc., it's um, the the risk of the quorum of all, uh, all mints colluding against you or disappearing, which is the same risk, uh, essentially. Okay. Um, so my next my my next question is um, let's let's compare it then to to things like Monero and and Zcash. Mm -hmm. um, another layer on top of of those two has the same trade-offs or yes yes it does i mean the 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 upside of something like script is in those three aspects it is extremely fast like sub-second uh, confirmations it is provable private um which means that your anonymity set is extremely long and you know how big it is and number three is that it's ultra cheap because you don't have as many. So, for example, the competitive mining. Well, there's no currency, don't have. Grid, essentially. When you say cheap, exactly. cheap, you say calculation in terms of calculation. It's cheap. It is, it is ultra cheap when it comes to total cost of transaction. So, the total cost of transaction in Bitcoin, I don't know what it is right now, but it's, it's not millicents. Um, total cost of transactions in something like Squid is millicents, no matter how much you transact. Okay, so what is that transaction denominated in? Is it denominated in script or is it denominated in uh, one of the currencies that you're, that you're doing a DBC with? 
Well, right now it's not denominated at all because it's so cheap that it doesn't really make sense to um, charge per transaction. So <laughs> it, it actually costs more money to calculate the fees than the uh, than the actual fees that you would have to take. So while there is a, a protocol uh, thought on how to do that, so basically get a transaction currency that you pay, would pay fees in, um, we actually never implemented that because it, it kind of doesn't make sense to do that. So um, there, it might be better to 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 fund the system differently than uh, per transaction fees. So it's like a subscription model or something like that. As a well, it it depends on the context in which you're using a script mint. So, for example, if you have a local community that is using that as a local payment system for goods and services then it might be something where people of the community just say, okay, we're going to fund it. Like merchants are going to fund it because it increases uh, business. So that might be it. I mean, you can... Okay, you so, can so we're an exchange. It. We're a decentralized, yeah. trustless, uh, trust-minimized exchange uh, with swaps, margin trading, lending, borrowing, all of those things. Uh, I'm not really seeing much bot action on our on our platform yet, but I can imagine as it's as it scales up, there's going to be much more of that. Um, give the pitch for an exchange for whether it's us or Uniswap or even a sex. So one has to be uh, one has to keep in mind that uh, Strit only does swaps. So that is the the main construction um, that is interesting for exchanges. So what you would do as an exchange, or more specifically as a group of exchangers, um, the group of exchangers would together form a federation and uh, together co-sign the uh, on-chain um, addresses that keep the actual value. And together issue DBCs in whatever currencies um, they support in their system. And that allows every customer of any of those exchanges to transfer uh, money into the exchange federation and then create swaps with anybody else uh, in the federation without the involvement of the exchange itself. So, of which course, means the exchange... cross -chain, which means cross chain, essentially. Yes, yes. So you can have, um, you of course have the confirmation time on both sides of the um, of the cryptocurrencies. Basically, you have to uh, to put the money in, but as soon as the money is in script, uh, it is ultra fast cross chain uh, ex ex exchanges swaps whatever. Um, so it's the the main question is how do you find the counterparty for such a trade, and that is basically. Um, an API that the exchanger has to provide. That's the service that okay. the exchanger Okay, and works. there's essentially not a need for an Oracle anywhere in the system. No, there's not. Only for market makers. <laughs> okay, and where would a market maker uh, uh, Oracle uh, on script live then? It doesn't live on script. So <laughs> using, utilizing script. Yes. So um, each script mint has the ability to query information from oracles. And it's very simple. So it's it's binary oracles. They either say yes or no. And you encode the um, question to the oracle in the ownership um, information of the DBC itself. So the DBC basically says, if oracle A true, then this is the owner if oracle um, uh, be true, then this is the owner. And you combine those DVCs in a swap transaction, um, which basically allows you to have um, a, a binary tree of uh, how the transaction could uh, execute. And then, yeah, that's basically it. Okay, cool. So give me five years from now. Where do we see script five years from now? What sort of timeline? I mean, this is years of research, um, an APK, code repos. What do you need from people in the crypto community? What do you need from people who are working on our bounties? Because we have bounties that are that are relevant to this. Um, yeah, 
what do you want people to do for this? So Other than being aware of it <laughs> for implementations. So right now, what we're looking at, um, and it's it's not decided yet, but um, the development of Script has been relatively expensive. So as you said, there there have been uh, years of thinking in there. There's uh, something like a hundred thousand lines of code, etc. So um, what we're currently looking at is at a way to um, make it open source, support future development in it and apply it to new use cases. So we're actually currently thinking about setting up a company that helps with hosting mints, that helps with uh, packaging mints. So if you have a community that wants to operate a federation itself, that your technical know-how is lower, um, that helps integrators in using the SDK with consulting and programming, etc., PP, and helps um, in modeling new use cases for it. And uh, the thing that I'm mostly looking at is actually not cryptocurrencies. So um, I only have a limited interest in cryptocurrencies. So what I'm mostly looking at is using this to um, bring shares in corporations and shares in title into the crypto world. So you're a, I want you to be able to trade houses and cars in this. Okay, so this is a discussion that we're having obviously in the NFT space. Could you imagine uh, pairing DBCs, script DBCs with NFTs? Well, um, there is no such thing in script proper as um, a future DBC being constrained by a previous DBC, which is uh, necessary if you want to have something like profit splitting. Um, so you can only do that for exactly one step, and, but you cannot do that for a history of transactions. Mm -hmm. um, for that... So it's uh, not a provenance trail at all? No. So quite... It, that is basically what breaks the system. So Scrit is anonymous and untraceable. And everything that uh, requires traceability, you cannot do in Scrit proper. And there are thoughts about having a second version of script or a second model in script which is non-blind certificates which would allow tracing mm -hmm. and which allow uh, implementing uh, smart contracts on based on dvcs and we actually have that code for that so we actually have a a, a digital beer certificate engine with uh, smart contracts um, Using Solidity or Clarity no, or no 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 it's uh, a self-implemented um, register-based uh, VM. Okay. So a very simple one and uh, but powerful enough for most things. So you could do something like that if you mix those two worlds, but um, personally I'm not that interested in that. So what I'm mostly interested in is um, making the current standard transactions of the vault economy usable for anonymous, fast, digitalized success. That is what I'm interested in. I'm not really interested in NFTs at all. Um, I want you to be able to sell um, the access to an Airbnb lock. Yes, but I don't need an NFT for that. I can do that with script without NFTs. Cool. So we could spend. I could spend another hour talking to you about this. We should. We should. Um, we should have a conversation together with Iago uh, and with our tech lead Aurora um, uh, about multiple things uh, regarding script. How we could. We could do an implementation and how it is that we can assist in in uh, enabling funded development, um, either either over Gitcoin or via the Origins platform. Uh, where it is that we're, we're doing multiple launches. I think that this could be uh, a really great place for, for Script to live. Um, so I will make that, I will make that stuff happen. Um, I really, not, nobody inside of the team was familiar with Script. Um, so that was the main reason for, for me inviting you, uh, as opposed to also making the wider community familiar with your work. But uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that our team uh, we'll take a deeper look at it and get in touch with you. We've been looking at, uh, you know, Xiaomi and Cash. I know multiple developers have been looking at Xiaomi and Cash solutions. Uh, so 
definitely need to hook you up with Yago uh, and Aurora and Jamie uh, for you guys to do some brainstorming about how it is that we can uh, see what we can do together. Thanks so much, like that. Um, Smuggler Man. And um, I guess we'll see each other latest in October in Prague. I hope um, so. I reached out to 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 the team there and and also uh, Sovereign's offering to to sponsor uh, the event this year. So uh, hopefully we'll have a chance uh, to see each other in person again then. I would like that. Cool, man. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me on. Cheers.